Hello and welcome to Streamers and Punches, the podcast from Sound Notion TV that looks at current events and news in the world of film music. My name is Bill Witham. And I'm Kevin Wilt. And on today's episode, we've got a fantastic interview with Bear McCrary, who I like to call Mr. Television right now because he's very much involved in a lot of shows and has been doing really cool shows over the last decade. So we'll get to that a little bit later on. Uh, we've got a couple quick headlines to mention and a few things we've been watching and then some new CDs that have been out in the last week or so that are very cool and worth picking up. So first thing uh, for headlines, uh, Breaking Bad has started its final season and the score of the entire run of the show has been composed by Dave Porter and it's a quite a fantastic score and there's been some different podcasts from different websites that have covered it and things like that but the best way to experience it is just watch the show uh, or you can read an article that we have linked to where he basically just talks about revving up into the final season and, and what's going on there but great score uh, for television it's one of my favorites and I, I struggle to find if there's actually a normal instrument a, an actual real live instrument that's used at all in that score because it sounds like it's just a really cool collection of homemade sounds that he's sort of weaved together. Yeah. I think a lot of it is like found object kind of stuff, which is really cool. Yeah. 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 Very, very cool. Works really well for that show too, I think. Um, speaking of other composers that are doing interesting things that may not be a household name just yet, like Dave Porter, another one named Ryan Amon is the uh, composer for the new movie Elysium, or at least the, it, the a recent movie Elysium. Uh, it's the second movie from uh, the director of uh, District 9, and his name at this moment sort of escapes me. Neil something. Neil Blomkamp. Thank you, Thank Kevin. You. Yeah. You're uh, so there's a great article about how Ryan Amon basically got the gig for that, and it's almost in film music circles. It's kind of akin to a Cinderella story because he had been doing small projects and sort of put in his, his, uh, his demo to the, the filmmakers and got a call. So it was kind of interesting that they sought out someone who does not have a, a huge name just yet and may soon after the movie. Um, for the Guardians of the Galaxy, the, one of the big, uh, the big new movies for Marvel coming up on their, I think they're calling it uh, Phase 2. Is that right, Kevin? Phase yeah. 2 is the, sort of the next. So, but between like the end of Avengers and now, we're, we're in Phase 2. We're so Iron Man 3 two. was the first Phase 2 movie, I guess. Right, and then there'll be a, there'll be a Thor movie in November. Um, New Captain like, America. New Captain America, right? Yeah. Probably and this one, and then I think it's Avengers two. And okay, um, is what about the Ant Man, the Edgar Wright? I I don't know if that's going to be out early enough. I don't know if that comes out before Avengers two yet. I'm not sure. Okay, okay, but maybe the other big one is just this one, Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, I think so. Marvel, Marvel meets Star Wars is kind of how I think of that. It's very sort of intergalactic, but Tyler Bates uh, has been hired to score that. So uh, that'll be just a cool project to watch it evolve and see how it turns out because Marvel has differentiated itself from DC uh, in many ways. Um, music is kind of one of them, but they've also embraced the sort of craziness of the stories and the characters where DC is a little bit more uh, convinced that they have to make everything grounded in reality. So, you know, pros and cons, you can kind of go, you can kind of figure that out for yourself. But music will, will be interesting to see how that develops as well. Uh, and then uh, you, you found something about the upcoming Godzilla movie, Kevin. Yeah, they just announced a, a day or two ago, I think, that Alexander Desplat uh, will be scoring the new Godzilla movie that comes out, I think, within the next year or so. I think it's already started shooting. Um, yeah. So that would be kind of interesting, too. I mean, he's scored, you know, some bigger action films. He's done, you know, Argo and a couple of Harry Potter movies. Um, I'm not sure. I'm, I, nothing really comes to mind that he's done that is, is kind of maybe as big and nasty uh, a movie as, as a Godzilla movie. I, mean, I, don't, I, I don't think he's done any, like, big monster movie type things like this. So that would be kind of interesting to see because I think usually when we think of his scores – and comparing him to a lot of other composers like a Tyler Bates that you just mentioned, Alexander Desplat seems to be a, a much more subtle composer, I think. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what he does with literally a, a gargantuan movie, a movie about a gi gigantic monster. Yeah, yeah. So um, very cool there. So mostly just news about upcoming gigs for composers. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. The next thing is uh, there's been a few more summer movies that have come out uh, in the last – 
or since our last podcast. And I just wanted to catch everybody up on a few of those. Uh, as far as like what I've had a chance to check out, I already mentioned Breaking Bad. It's now in its last eight episodes, and I managed to catch up with. I missed last summer's, so I watched those fairly quickly. And it, and at the same time, I was noticing that the Dave Porter, like I mentioned, had been doing interviews, and I started uh, noticing. I mean, I'd always noticed the music in, in the opening title. It's it's very striking, but when you watch the episodes, there's some just some fantastic scoring that are going on in there. It's it's yeah. completely. It's it's um, a sort of unique. I hate I hate the word quirky for something like this, but it's unique. It's uh, maybe idiosyncratic is a better word because it just sounds very specific with the choice of sounds and the and the sort of style. And it's a way it covers kind of a weird dark humor um, and yet a kind of a, a, a the, the underlying drama of the show. It seems to to cover it all its bases pretty well and have a sort of sense of energy or a sense of urgency. And just watching a few scenes. Are just fantastic. Um, so if anyone even has a chance, this, the older season from last year or the final season part one, is on Netflix, and you can just watch the very first episode of that. And the scene where, let's just say Walter White is dotting his eyes and crossing his T's. He's having to sort of clean up something, and and he's sort of being very methodical about it. And the music during that scene was just fantastic. So. Uh, it was just very, very cool, very like textbook scoring, but very clever and creative at the same time. Good choice of sounds, good rhythms. I loved it. Um, anyway, I, I did see Elysium. I thought Ryan Amon's score was was a good contributing factor. Although it, it is a big movie, very big visually, very big movie stars. Uh, the score had you know had to sort of do the sort of normal big summer blockbuster thing with big brass, big strings, and all big percussion. It, it managed to do that, but it had a little bit of its own uh, characteristics as well. Um, I caught a movie, it was sort of a guilty pleasure. Uh, Solomon Kane is something that had been made about like 2008 or 2009, was sort of a supernatural fantasy, um, like eight, 1800s. It's sort of a, 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 a mashup of, of many things. Um, anyway, it had finally been released on Blu-ray and and I was listening to the score, and I thought it's sort of covering its bases. You know, it's heroic and dark. And I thought it kind of sounds a little like Pirates of the Caribbean, but not as piratey, I guess. <laughs> and then I found that the the music was written by Klaus uh, Bottled, Klaus Bottled, and uh, he was one of the co-composers with Hans Zimmer on the all the Pirates movies. Uh, had a chance to revisit the X Men movies, and uh, they're all all three are different. Although you could argue two and three are similar, and Maybe that's worth a longer discussion, but I actually found myself enjoying Michael Kamen's music to the first movie a little bit more because he approached it maybe a, a tad bit with more maturity. And then X Men two and three are just kind of more like it's more like fun bubblegum kind of music in a way, I, and that that is a discredit by summing it up too much. But um, there are nice things to note in the second and third movie, but but they do pick up the speed and and ramp up the action quite a bit in the music. So they're fun, but but the Michael Kamen score in the first one is um is in, is quite it stands apart. And then uh and then as we mentioned, I've seen The World's End and um the score for that I thought wasn't necessarily stand outish or or, or notable mm -hmm. in any particular way, but it was very supportive. It was there to capture the action, the emotion. So it it yeah. did a good job of scoring. Yeah, I I watched um, I went and saw World's End as well and kind of revisited um, the other Cornetto trilogy movies, so Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz, and and you're right, it's it's maybe not you know um, Stephen Price's score to the World's End maybe doesn't really grab your attention a whole lot, but um, but I think it works well for the movie in that in all three of the movies, music is is treated in such a way. That, that I think works. Um, that all three movies, in some ways, are trying or, or or pretending to be more serious movies than they actually are. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, Shaun of the Dead is supposed to be like it's 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 a comedy, but it's trying it's pretending like it's as scary as a regular zombie movie. And Hot Fuzz is a comedy, but it's trying to pretend like it's a big Michael Bay action you know, bad boys kind of movie. And that's yeah. part of what makes all these movies very funny. Um, yeah. But part of that is is the score. The score goes along with that game. 
a, a little bit. You know, the score doesn't necessarily acknowledge the silliness what's going on. Uh, the score is taking the movie as seriously as the movie is taking itself, which is part of what makes it really funny. Um, so in that sense, I think this, the, the scores to The World's End and, and the other films um, work nicely because it's, it's kind of, you know, it reminds me of the, the Elmer Bernstein approach to Animal House, that here is this ridiculous college movie, and, and, and what does he do with it? He, he scores it as if it's this really serious film about human drama and that these, these frat boys are really going through something tough. And, and when they vanquish their enemies, it's, it's a serious victory. And so that more serious tone playing against the ridiculous things happening on screen is really funny. You know, if, if, these, if any of these films had more, you know, goofball cartoony scores, I think it really ruins a lot of the jokes. Um, so I, I'm glad that the scores for these three films have done what they've done because I think it just made them funnier. Yeah, yeah. No, I definitely enjoyed them as well. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, uh, this almost has nothing to do with our podcast because we try to cover film music, but but recently they did announce the casting choice for the new Batman Superman movie coming up. And of course they mentioned that Batman will be played by Ben Affleck. So the internet erupted as one might have expected with everyone deciding that their opinions were equally noteworthy. <laughs> anyway, I thought it was kind of interesting because whether or not our, our viewers and listeners know this, the... Batman Trilogy by Christopher Nolan were all produced by Nolan and uh, some other people. Charles Roven was one of them. And as they hyped up Man of Steel, they noted in the advertisements that it was all produced by the same people. This time it's just directed by Zack Snyder. But Charles Roven still produced it. Christopher Nolan was a producer. Mm -hmm. But Hans Zimmer was the composer for both franchises. Yeah. He did all three Batman movies and then he started Man of Steel. And then he's, you know, as... As he established the sound worlds for both, he was very well documented with all his videos of the 12 drummers or, or his videos of people scratching razor blades on electric cellos for the Dark Knight, and et cetera, et cetera. So my question is, since Batman's going to be different, but the production team is the same, and I'm only assuming Hans Zimmer will be brought back to score the, the Man so, of Steel sequel, what is his musical approach going to be to Batman in this sequel because it's a different Batman played by a different actor, and is he just going to phone it in and have his, you know, what the the D minor, you know, whatever that little that little interval of a minor third? Is he going to just yeah phone that? That's or a good question. Because I think they they sort of acknowledge that this this Batman that Ben Affleck is going to play is is a different Batman. This is not this is this is a Batman of a different universe. Than Christian Bale's Batman, which is the thing, right? There's a lot of Batmans. Kind of, I Bats mean, men. It's, yeah, there, there, there are a lot of Bat Batman, Batman. Um, <laughs> no, like Surgeon's yeah. General, <laughs> right? right. Um, uh, there, there are a lot of Knights Dark, right? Um, <laughs> I, I think, guess I'm thinking of Spider's Men. <laughs> yeah, or or Professor's Xavier, maybe. Right. <laughs> right. Um. <laughs> um no, so I think for him to use the same musical material, it would be very confusing if they are saying that this this is a different universe that this Batman is living in. But at the same time, if you're him, you know, not only it's is it tough, you know, tough following John Williams Superman, and to a lesser degree, I think tough following Danny Elfman's Batman, but to have to score the same character. Yeah, and but, but then do it different on top of all those other things. Yeah, that's 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 a really hard assignment. Yeah, I mean, I, I was t I can't remember if it was you I told this, but I said I don't think the pressure is on Ben Affleck in all of this. He just has to go work out for two hours a day and and you know read his lines and wear the outfit. The pressure is going to be on this. the director, and right now the director is writing it, and then the, later the pressure is going to be on Zimmer because I'm only assuming he's going to yeah. score. And uh, right. Right. so he's going to have to come up with a new, a, yet another new approach to Batman. And yet I kind of feel like he'll probably, it'll sort of echo what he's already come up with. That would be my, yeah, that would be my, my prediction, but it's just an interesting question. No one else has really brought it up yet. And they're saying it's a different Batman, but it's the same production team and the same, it's got a similar thread 
from Man of Steel coming from the Dark Knight trilogy, except that, now that's the thing, I think one of the things that's confusing about what what I think they're trying to do with these DC movies, and, and yeah, I think it, it directly applies to music too, is that you know they hired Christopher Nolan and Jonathan Nolan and all those guys to help out with Man of Steel to try and give it a similar kind of tone as the Dark Knight, but now they're saying that what is is continuing on is a different universe than the dark Knight. So now you have this problem of, okay, we've set up that it's a similar kind of thing, but now we have to try and make it different. And, and that applies to music as well. That's a tricky thing. Yeah. And they could have solved all of this by just having Joseph Gordon Levitt, but cause he's set up at the end of. If, if, if they, if they can make the Superman universe, a continuation of the, the dark Knight universe is what you're saying. Yeah, 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 which which yeah. would have solved all Hans Zimmer's musical problems, but that's assuming Hans Zimmer is going to be scoring it. But anyway, which, which I I think is a safe assum- a safe assumption. I think you can assume that Hans Zimmer is, will be scoring this next movie. But yeah, I mean, musically, that's a tough assignment. It's we want you to write something that's similar to this thing you've already done, but it has to be different. I mean, that's yeah, that's and hard. it's an iconic character that the entire world is pretty familiar right. with. No pressure, right? <laughs> so. Well, we'll see what uh, Hans Zimmer does with that. So anyway, again, yeah, no pressure. <laughs> so you got you mentioned earlier in the show um, some new CD releases you wanted to talk about. One of them has yeah. kind of piqued my interest a little bit. Can you guess which one? Uh, actually, no. Would okay. that be The Matrix Reloaded? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, just I just uh, want to go through a couple of these. They're all actually, let's see, one, two. They're all kind of older movie scores. Um Poltergeist 2 is from around 1982. Oh, crap. I don't know the year. I, the first one is 82. I know that. Poltergeist 2, I want to say, is 83 or 84, somewhere in there. Uh, also, it's composed by Jerry Goldsmith, the same composer who wrote for the first film. And the Poltergeist score for the first one is amazing. And I'm looking forward to hearing Poltergeist 2. I actually am not familiar with it. Uh, big fan of Goldsmith, though, as anyone knows who's listened to the podcast. Anyway, Matrix Reloaded is coming out. It's on 2CD. That is composed by Don Davis, and he composed all three of the Matrix films. And this is the first time it has not been released in a 2CD you know, complete form. Uh, why has the first it? movie been released in a 2CD format? I think it must have been, right? Uh, I, I mean, they wouldn't have done this one think, first. I think, but... Yeah, I don't remember. Um, yeah, I ended anyway. up... Yeah, I can't remember. I'd have to check on that. So uh, then James Newton Howard's score for Wyatt Earp, the Kevin Costner version of Wyatt Earp, not the Tombstone version with Kurt Russell, uh, from about 1995, I want to say. 1995 or 94, something like that. Somewhere in there. um, Was, you know, not a bad movie. It was just really, really long. It was was the epic approach to Wyatt Earp's story rather than the action approach, which is why. It's 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 kind of like the traditional biopic yeah, film of yeah. we're going to take you all the way through this person's life and but it's going to feel say, like a lifetime that was my introduction to James Newton Howard was like that yeah. and Waterworld and I was like I love James Newton Howard yeah. and, uh, and so me too and I'm, this, this is the one that I'm kind of excited about I, I really like this score um, if, oh, I love this, it. Yeah. this was like the big western score of, of the 90s there weren't really too many others um, yeah. yeah, the movie is really long. I, I like the film, but it, it's probably – you could cut it down by an hour and it would still be a, a pretty good feature-length film. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I, I really like this score. It's it's sort of big orchestra, western, classic kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and it works really, really nicely. Um, so, yeah, this this is the one – for me, if I was going to spend you know the 30 bucks for any of these, this is probably the one that I would be picking up. Okay. All right, the final so, one – is uh, and I want to, of course, I'd want to gush more about Wyatt, but I, I won't. We don't have time for it. But um, Star Trek Insurrection is the, let's see, the third to, is it third to last or second to last? It's, the, it's hang on, let's let's nerd out for a second here. It's yeah, the, second it's last. the third movie with the Next Generation crew, so this would have been four movies ago, right? And and there was only one more with them afterwards. Yes. So uh, anyway, but there's an expanded collector's edition, and you can get all of these, as I mentioned before, uh, screenarchives.com is a great place to go. Yeah. Good people there, um, and they've got all these things. So it's awesome. There's a bunch of other releases as well. There's some things by Henry Mancini and some television show scores if you're into Revenge or Once Upon a Time, but I didn't have chance. I didn't really think those would be that 
monumental of releases to fans because these other scores have been await uh, people have been awaiting them for a long time. Right. Plus, so anyway. we have more important things to talk about anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so um, anyway, so we were fortunate enough recently to talk to Bear McCrary, and as you'll notice when he describes all the projects he's involved with, Bear is a very busy guy. So we really appreciate him uh, having the time to talk to us. And I don't think there's much else to say. I, um, disclaimer, uh, please excuse any fanboy gushing on my part because I have grown up with the Battlestar TV show and I loved it. So um, I did ask him a few questions about that. And um, I felt I slipped into Chris Farley territory there for a minute. But You remember you, when you were with the Beatles? <laughs> you be the judge of that. I like that one episode that you scored. It was great. You remember yeah. that one? But uh, anyway, we had a good time talking to him. Very nice guy, very giving of his time, very talented, and it's uh, it's great to see him getting the gigs that he's getting. And yep. I look forward to an Emmy nomination seeing. coming up for um, Da Vinci's Demons for the main title, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah, best of best of luck on that. So, and then of course the last guy we interviewed, Michael Price, I think he's also nominated for an Emmy for Sherlock. So, yeah. So no pressure uh, for whoever wins that one. Yeah. Already, both of them both of them get to benefit from the streamers and punches bump. That's so right. we'll they see get, which one of them it pays off more for. They get the award show bounce and the streamers. Yeah. And, yeah. and and those Emmys will be set Sunday, September twenty two. Yeah. So well, obviously okay. it has to be one of those two people because they'll they'll both be benefiting from 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 being on our show. So it's just it's it's a fifty fifty shot as to which which guy it's gonna be. So all right. So with all of that, and without any further ado, please enjoy our interview with Bear McCrary. And joining us today is composer Bear McCrary. Bear has been doing quite a bunch of work for, I'd almost say, the last 10 years. Um, I first saw his name in relation to Battlestar Galactica, and with, uh, with the scores for the episodes there, it kind of, I don't know, I just kind of thought it set a new sound that... I've been kind of hearing a lot of other shows, but he's been very busy since then. Uh, da Vinci's Demons has been uh, a pretty large project. And then, as we mentioned in one of our previous podcasts, he's been also assigned to Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. for ABC coming up next fall. So a lot of stuff on his plate and uh, a lot of stuff on his IMDb resume as well. <laughs> so we've got him here. We're really excited because he's a very prolific guy and he's very busy. So we appreciate you having time to chat with us today, Bear. That's awesome. Yeah, of course. Um, let, also, I just wanted to mention, so congrats on the Emmy nomination as best main title for Da Vinci's Demons. Um, that's, uh, that's pretty cool, I guess. I don't yep. have one. It was a, <laughs> uh, a fun way to start Comic-Con, for sure. I found that out uh, the Thursday morning, like way early in the morning, that, uh, you know, the Thursday of Comic-Con. And that was, a, uh, that was a real surprise. It was great. In the main title... Uh, is it a combination of voices and sort of the older instruments and everything together and electronics, or is it uh, is it just because I'll admit I haven't had a chance to hear it, although I have heard some of the music from the Da Vinci's Demon series. I've been watching the little YouTube videos, but I have not seen the main title just yet. Is it a combination of everything? Yeah, I, it would it would take you a whopping sixty seconds to see it, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well on this. <laughs> for those of you who haven't heard it, um, it is, uh, you know, the score to Da Vinci's Demons is, uh, on the surface, it sounds very, uh, very much like a Renaissance score. There's a lot of period instrumentation, and I even use period uh, um, melodies and stuff in, in the score. Um, the main title itself, I was inspired by Leonardo da Vinci, his ability to write forwards and backwards. And I thought, well, if he can write words that way, his music should be written that way. So I decided to write his music as a palindrome. So his theme is actually the same if you play it forwards and backwards. Um, it was a neat idea. Um, it was a challenge, actually, to, to do that and have it be something that is emotionally appropriate and and interesting and you know, do all the things that you really need a score to do. Um, but, you know, I think, I, I think that we, we really got there. Um, it's, it's an exciting theme and it's emotional. And when you play it forwards, it feels very heroic. When you play it backwards, what I call the, the B section, it, it's very dark and conflicted. And so I use the forwards and backwards versions in different parts in the show 
uh, depending on what I need. So, you know, to have an Emmy nomination for for a theme like that, it was it was really exciting. It was really cool to be recognized for something that that I had put a lot of um, a lot of time and energy into constructing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask about if, it, if you don't mind going back to Battlestar for a little bit. Um, how did you originally get involved with that? Was it working with the producers or uh, a submission or because um, we try to treat it like if people are interested in breaking into TV or, or film scoring, what are some steps that successful people have done to get where they got? Well, everyone has a different story. Everyone has a different way of getting into the business. Um, Battlestar Galactica was my, as you mentioned, my first gig. Um, I was about 18 months uh, less, more like 15 months out of school um, when I became the sole composer on the show. Um, my path, I, I, um, I was an assistant to composer Richard Gibbs, who was the composer on the miniseries. And when it went to series, uh, he was and is very busy doing feature films, so he didn't have time to do a TV thing. So it fell on it fell on me, and uh, the producers took a risk and let me do a couple episodes, and then it became a couple more episodes, and you know, eighty episodes later, I'd, I'd done the whole show. Um, as for you know the path in, it's different for everybody. You know, it, it wasn't like I was just happenstantically involved with being a composer. I mean, I had by even by the time I started working with Richard out of school, you know, I'd been. I've been dedicated to writing music for film and TV for, for, man, just about a decade already at that point. I mean, I was, I was really, I was, I was five when I decided I wanted to do this. And I was, I would say 12 or 13 was the first time I wrote a piece of music that, that was a piece of music. And I thought to myself, okay, I, I can do this. I, I, I think I have the skill set or I'm, you know, beginning to get the skill set. So, you know, by the time I was 23, or I guess even 22 at the time, you know, I, I, have been at it for a long time. So really, you know, the path into the business, I, I would say in a general sense is, is to love what you're doing so much that you'll do it whether or not you get paid. If you're just trying to get into the business, I think that's a failed venture from the beginning. You know, mm -hmm. I just wanted to write music. That's all I wanted to do. And I, I wrote music for myself i wrote music for student films independent films plays whatever if if someone needed some music i would write it and i was and remain you know very happy with that so i think you know that is the beginning and and if you are that kind of person i think people are going to want to work with you and and that ultimately leads into more and more professional environments yeah yeah that's cool oh uh, no that's great advice um <clears throat> definitely fills in some gaps for anybody wondering because they see sort of the end result and then they wonder what led up to it and everything else. Um, let's see. Uh, you've got a new record label. Did yeah. you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, how did that come about? Well, it's interesting. I've, I put out a lot of soundtracks uh, in my day, um, <laughs> my short day. But uh, I, I, I'd always wanted to start a label so that I could – just have more control and be more aggressive in pursuing the projects that I, that I wanted to get out. Um, getting a soundtrack out is not easy. Even when you've done 15 or 20, like I've done now, every new show, every new movie, every game, it's an uphill battle trying to convince whoever needs to be convinced to put an album out. And, um, so I just wanted to kind of go vigilante a little bit and take matters into my own hands and have a label <laughs> so that I could, through my label, approach studios with a, with a real professional offer. I think when a composer goes to a studio, I think they don't take you seriously. They assume it's a vanity project. You, want, you just want your music out because you have a big ego, and mm -hmm. there's really no reason for them to, to put it out. But there are reasons. There's a lot of compelling you know, financial reasons for a studio to want to release their material. Um, so you can just, with a label, I, I found I, I can be taken a lot more seriously. And... Um, right out of the gate, um, my label, which is called Sparks and Shadows, um, we got uh, Da Vinci's Demons, the, 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 the complete score. We got Defiance, the video game, Defiance, the TV show, and Europa Report. And we're in the process now of negotiating a few other things. So it, it was really, a, 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 I think, a, a wise investment on my part. I mean, it, 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 it paid off immediately. So that was exciting, and, and it's something now that I'm doing it, I don't, I don't know why every composer doesn't do it. 
Sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> but it is, but it, is it, a lot of work. I'm not going to lie. But it's, uh, <laughs> to me, putting out a really well thought out and well edited album that's been mastered professionally, that's where every project ends. So until that happens, I feel this sense of incompleteness. There's this lack of closure. So to me, it's, it's an incredibly important thing to be able to put these records out. So it, it was sort of a natural evolution. Um, I'd worked with a lot of labels, especially uh, La La Land Records, who I still have a great relationship with. And, and Sparks and Shadows does all of our um, signed physical CDs through La La Land's website. So we still have a partnership with them. And so it's a really, it's a really good situation. It seems um, like just in, in general, whether it's film and, and television or concert music or whatever, the whole idea of kind of taking charge and doing self-publishing seems to be really kind of all over the place. And this seems like it's just an extension of that. Absolutely. I think, I mean, I think there's a lot of parallels in the, in the publishing world and the web series world. And it's, um, I, think it's, I think it's something that, that artists need to really take seriously now because uh, the, the, the previous goal – I'm leaning more toward recording artists and singer-songwriters and rock bands now, but the the previous goal of just getting on a label and having them pay for everything and putting you on tour and booking you in a studio and just, you know, all your dreams come true, <laughs> that's kind of over, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's a bummer, but at the same time, excuse me, at the same time... Um, your food's ready. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um at the same time, it's really cool that we have a little more control now over over um, over our over our artistic product. Um, so, I've I've got to go back to Battlestar just for one quick question, and uh, and then this can kind of segue over to um, uh, the the Da Vinci's Demons because they're kind of related. Um, for choice of instrumentation. Uh, so I think it'd be kind of an understatement to say there's percussion in your Battlestar scores um, a little yeah. bit. Yeah, sure. There's a little here and there. Um, <laughs> I, I just remember, maybe it's because the way we see uh, a main title so often when you fall in love with a show and you watch, sometimes you even binge and you watch several episodes, you always hear that main title. And I always got used to way, the way it would have about about two thirds of the way through the main title, it would be sort of the almost atmospheric with the vocal, and then about the you know about the golden ratio, it would kick yeah. off, and it'd be <laughs> high speed percussion as uh, as it ramped a bunch of uh, quick cut scenes from that episode, and it was just really like full of adrenaline, and and it got to where it's like okay, there's there's not a discernible melody per se, but I love like the energy, I love the choice. Was it something that um, when you mentioned working with uh, Richard Gibbs that he had kind of set up and and the producer said we want to stay with that or were you thinking um, well, I have freedom you know, but I want to he, he he wrote that that's his piece of music <clears throat> okay so actually that came from that idea even predated him and I actually that uh, that oh, wow. vocal is called the Gayatri mantra and it's actually. Um, it's in Sanskrit. It's an old Sanskrit chant. When I say old, I'm, I don't mean like, I don't mean like the '60s. I mean <laughs> old, one of the oldest pieces of music um, that has remained. Um, it's probably thousands of years old, uh, and that was something actually that Edward James almost played on the set of the miniseries while they were filming to get everybody in the mood and and create this feeling like they were working on something new. So even before a composer was hired, long before a composer was hired, that sense of otherworldliness was was already affiliated with the show and i know that um the percussive section at the end of the main title you know it was a response to the idea of having um different having footage from the episode you're about to see in the main title of of each episode so it may, obviously the main title was different every week um which in and of itself was it was a pretty daring and interesting um interesting choice it was something that uh uh, kind of goes back to the, the 60s and 70s. You used to have shows that would, that would try something like that, but it's, it's pretty rare in the modern era to do that. I can't think of another show that did, but, but it was cool. I mean, I think, I think we're prepared for binge watching now, and I think main title sequences um, are something that I know for me personally, I, I, I try to write something that will be rewarding multiple times. And, um, you know, I think Da Vinci's Demons has that. I think there's a lot in there that it sort of rewards you for, for watching it over and over again. And I think all that all the best main titles do that. 
Well, with the choice of instruments, this is my segue, weak as it may be, to get to Da Vinci's Demons. Um, when you, and this is part, partially asked by Dave, our producer, um, I saw some of the videos where you showed uh, how you are collaborating with the USC professor of ancient music, or, um, it, okay, the Renaissance specialist, and so on and so forth, yeah, and you're able to... Yeah, he uh, is a, uh, he teaches the early music and runs the early music ensemble, and ironically, I didn't even know this about him, his specialty is the music of Florence in Da Vinci's time, so he came <laughs> with so much knowledge oh, wow. and experience, it was incredible working with him. When uh, when you worked with him and you decided on the certain sounds of the different instruments, um, whether it be sort of like the natural trumpet or the viola da gamba and the the uh, crumb horn and the and the different all the hurdy gurdy and the different variety of guitars, uh, was it ever discussed about what what actually like the audience would be able to tell the difference with, or was it like no, we're going to go with the authentic one all the way because we we have to or or is it a combination of all of the above? Well, you know, when you're using unusual instruments, there's always a risk that um, you're going you're gonna to lose information that you could communicate to the audience because of the limitations of the instrument. And this is where, personally, I find uh, a lot of ethnic music and film scores to be really irritating because a lot of the times it's just left to the performer to kind of improvise and they kind of do what they do, and then that's the end of it. It, it just becomes a color. Um, I, I really kind of roll up my sleeves, and, and I, I really try to learn what the instruments are capable of. Uh, what are their ranges? What instruments are they good at? Or what sounds are they, are they good at using? What notes can they play? What notes can they not play? Um, and things like that. Once you really internalize that, I think you know, you, you're able to write music more specific to that instrument, and then as such you're able to tailor the experience so that what the audience is hearing is not only music that happens to be played on a, on a period or ethnic instrument, but it's music that has to be played on an instrument. It's music that if you played it on a regular guitar, it, it, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't have the right emotional quality. Um, so, you know, a thing like Da Vinci's, it's a real challenge because there's these, these instruments have, have real limitations. And I think if you listen carefully um, to say the soundtrack album, and, and the soundtrack album is actually in chronological order. You can even hear my experiments. You can hear the sound of certain instruments um, a little ragged in, 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 C, in episode one. And by episode eight, everything just becomes a little more fluid and a little more dynamic as, I, as I'm figuring out, oh, that sounds good. I'm going to do more of that. Or that doesn't sound good. I'm going to do less of that. In a weird way, it's, it's like a crash course for me or, or like an honorary doctorate in, in early music. I mean, this is something I really didn't know a lot about. And, and now um, I really feel like I've, you know, I've learned a, a lot about it. But that's why I take on certain projects. It's, it's a, you know, a reason for me to broaden my palette and expand the toolbox and, and learn something that I didn't know. Um, my, one of my favorite moments was the, uh, I think, the Medici coat of arms with the different uh, balls positioned. Yeah, and to see how that sort of informed how the musical motive would be formed, or yeah. or to see rather how was it uh, Isaac who wrote the original yeah. that you, yeah. you guys were talking about? That was very cool because it was um, almost like visually matched exactly with the the shield. So for any listeners, that's like I have no idea what this host is talking about. There's a fantastic uh, YouTube video, and I forget which number it is, but it's basically where you're describing the um, sort of early music connection to the show. And uh, it's on your YouTube channel. Just yeah, it's, actually, it's, it's, if you... It's, it's in the last four or five uh, videos on my YouTube channel. And it's an interview with me and uh, Adam Gilbert, the music historian. And what he describes is, is actually the, the theme that I use for the Medici family in the show is actually the Medici theme that was written by their court composer in the late 1400s, composer named Isaac. And their um, crest is, uh, is um, six spheres. They're called pale. And the way the theme was constructed was sort of by putting staff lines across their crest and, and sort of writing music above it. It was really smart. And what's cool is that that's the sort of uh, little detail I like to put into my thematic writing. I mean, I already mentioned that, you know, I, the way I wrote my Leonardo theme was by thinking about the way he wrote his handwriting and, and emulating that. 
So here's a composer 500 years ago that's using a similar visual trick to, to write a theme for this family. And then, and then 500 years later in this TV show, that theme is recurring as a motive uh, for those characters. I, I think it's pretty cool. It's like reverse Augen music. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> oh, no. No, it's, it's very nice. Um, yeah, that's cool. Now, the other, uh, maybe other big elephant in the room I have totally forgot to mention is uh, Walking Dead. Um, and just to sort of take a step back from all this, you've got Battlestar Galactica um, and other, there's been other series along the way, um, The Cape and uh, uh, I forgot, I had a couple other shows on the tip of my tongue a second ago, but but then you have Walking Dead and then this fall you'll have Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, a lot of differences between these projects or yeah. you've, or have there been some amazing similarities or... Well, I, you know, I, I try to give every show its its own unique sound. I mean, I like to think if you hear two seconds of any random cue from the show, you'd know immediately um, what show it's from. And uh, I would, I, you know, I mean, are there similarities? Probably. I mean, it's all coming from my mind. But um, I, I, I like diversity, you know. I like, I, I get bored easily. So, you know, if I was working on three or four cop dramas it would probably you know you'd probably start hearing some similarities it would get kind of tiresome but in this case working on the walking dead and and Battlestar and da vinci's demons i mean every one of these shows has takes place in a unique environment and um has unique style you know walking dead especially isn't isn't like anything else i've done it's not like anything else on tv and now i'm doing um i believe the world's first pirate drama i could be wrong but I'm doing a show called Black Sails for Stars, which is um, really different. I mean, it sounds like nothing I've ever done before. So that's exciting for me to be able to do something. And, you know, to be honest, you know, I've, I've, I've turned down a couple projects where I just felt like, you know, I've done, I've done three shows that dealt directly with a small group of people trying to survive in a post-apocalyptic <laughs> environment, trying to survive a, an alien menace that looks like people, okay, <laughs> Actually, I did Battlestar, Terminator, Caprica, The Walking Dead, and even a big arc in Eureka dealt with this, like a big arc. So there's a certain point at which just not that any of those scores sounded the same, but I kind of feel like, hey, the, the, the post-apocalyptic television show, I've done um, – I've kind of done a lot in that environment, you know. So for me to do something like you know a period piece with Leonardo da Vinci or something with Pirates – uh, like Black Sails, or to work with Joss Whedon on Agents of Shield in the in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it's it's different and it's really exciting. It keeps me on my toes. So if um, if a guy calls and says it's your agent and he's got a project called Invasion of the Body Snatchers, then you'll know it's me just joking. It's yeah, just, exactly. Just, <laughs> okay, it'd be um, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and we want it to be all Tycho drums <laughs> <laughs> with a little bit of a of a oud. Or um, some other Persian instruments thrown in, just because. Exactly. Well, just because, what else? Because yeah. like what ethnic, else? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah, because that's what everyone's doing these days. Uh, <laughs> um, I think we were all kind of collectively wondering what are some um, musical sounds to anticipate for the Agents of Shield. If you can give us maybe a hint of what to expect, or because uh, you probably can't talk at all about the show. <laughs> well, I can. I just won't. <laughs> um, no, uh, the show, uh, well, I can say this, you know, the, the show was a, was a tricky balancing act for me to find the sound of it. Um, it takes place in the Marvel cinematic universe. And I, and I think there's an understanding obviously in bringing Joss back, uh, from doing the Avengers to spearhead this show that there, there's a connection there. I mean, you've got agent Coulson and, and, uh, other connections to the movies, um, so clearly you want it to sound like it belongs in those movies. You want, you want people to be able to take the DVDs of the movies and go right into Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and go right back into their movies, um, which is super exciting. On the flip side, the main characters, our protagonists, are not superheroes. We are not telling the story of people with powers. We're telling the story of the people that have to deal with the people with powers. So what does that sound like? You know, and, and um, so I think what you're going to hear is a is a big orchestral lyrical sweeping score um, closely related probably to anything I've done would be uh, 
like the Cape or Human Target, um, where I've got a full orchestra every week. I mean, we're, we're, we've got a 60 or 70 piece ensemble that you're going to hear in every episode. So, so it is a big thematic orchestral cinematic sound. But on the other side, there's an intimate human quirky quality that's there. Uh, it, it's something that that is sets it apart a little bit from from the big heroic uh, sounds of the movies because our hero is is Agent Coulson and and Agent Ward and these other uh, human characters and so they need to have they need to have something that sets them apart something that reminds us that their superheroism is coming from inside. Mm-hmm. How how unusual oh, is it to have those kinds of resources for a TV show? I mean, you mentioned sixty or seventy piece orchestra. Uh, it's extremely rare. It's yeah. extremely rare. I think um, you're hearing a lot more orchestral writing um, on television, and and I think you're you know you hear numbers like thirty or forty pretty frequently. Um, mm-hmm. So for for ABC and Disney and Marvel to um, to allow me to use these resources on a weekly basis is it's pretty extraordinary, and I think a, a real vote of confidence in what they believe the show can do and, 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 and obviously what they expect me to bring to it. Interesting. Now we, we often associate you, I think with, with TV more, more than maybe films just because of your, your roster of TV shows and being, you know, arguably the most active composer on television. Um, as Bill mentioned earlier, a little bit, uh, our show is kind of geared towards people who have an interest in, being film composers, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, your your choice of working in television, or or how how the process of working in television works, um, or even how that has changed over the few years <laughs> you've been doing it. Well, you know, it, it's a it's a big question that you've asked. Um, yeah. First of all, <laughs> I would say that um, just what do you, know, you do? <laughs> what is yeah. it that you would say that you do here? Yeah. Just, yeah, right, right. Yeah. I interface with the customers. Um, uh, so you're a people I person, gravitate yeah. toward things that are cool. I, that that's that's where I draw the line. Is I, I want to work on something that's that's cool. And so yeah. I've done a lot of television shows, um, done a handful of movies, and uh, I've got a few more coming out in the foreseeable future. Um, but, you know, I, I got into the business at a, at a very strange time. You know, looking back, I don't think anybody anticipated, but I think Battlestar Galactica was the beginning of a huge wave. It was, it was, the, it was the little ripple in what would become a huge wave in television, really a creative renaissance where talent at all levels, from stars down to post-production and, of course, composers. There be, there's this exodus uh, of talent from features into television right now, and it's, it's undeniable. I mean, even four oh, yeah. or five years ago, there were guys that were making their living doing features, doing three or four movies a year, um, and they were coming to television, you know? And, and it's ironic, too, because I, you know, I got into the business because I was inspired by film scores. I was not inspired by the television scores of the 80s, um, I was inspired by movies, you know, um, and uh, so I think there's a paradigm shift. I, I really do, and and I look at the creativity that I'm allotted and the resources that I'm allotted to express myself, um, and it's incredible. I mean, I am I am I am artistically satisfied, to say the least. I mean, I'm I'm challenged, and uh, and I get to develop thematic ideas over long stretches of time, and there's a big audience out there that's listening. Um, so that, you know, I, I fell into that, but I'm very, um, I, I'm very happy with, with where I am. I, I, obviously, I can't complain. Um, for younger composers, you know, getting into the business, I mean, obviously, you just want to, you want to get in where you can get in. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's short-sighted to try to focus on one area at all. Like I said earlier, I think, um, you know, when I was getting out of college, I was doing short films, I was doing little television projects, I was doing plays, I was doing musicals, I was doing albums for myself. I was doing, I mean, just, you should constantly be writing. I mean, that's, you never know where something's going to click or, or where you're going to meet someone. So, you know, ultimately, it's a, it's a little haphazard, I think, where you end up getting into the business. And I can't really think of anyone who, who got into the business precisely where they thought they would, you know? So you just never know where that opportunity is going to come up. 
Um, I was curious about, so if uh, some of your shows are still ongoing, like Walking Dead is about to have a third season start up soon, I think. It's uh, four. I mean, yeah, I knew that. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> oh, you were testing no, me. I passed the test. That's subliminal because I need to catch up on the third because that was the one I just missed. But anyway, anyway, so <laughs> so you have, okay, that's continuing. No spoilers. Yeah. Is uh, Da Vinci's Demons, is that continuing? Yes, Da Vinci's Demons has a second season, so I'm very excited about that. I got a lot and more then, to say there. And then uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. is about to debut. Mm -hmm. So how do you balance those three? Those are not three small shows, but those are rather significant productions. And how... <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, and I'm also on uh, Defiance, and I'm also on Black Sails. So, <laughs> yeah. you two there. Just who are you, and what? <laughs> how and, many of you are there? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, I am. I am a Cylon, and there are many copies. Uh, no, <laughs> look, man. I mean, I'm I'm not sleeping the way I used to a few years ago. Um, I mean, I'm definitely my output is is pretty extreme um, for the past. 12 months I have I have had to average writing five to six minutes of music a day and that means if I only write three minutes in one day I gotta write seven the next day and that counts Christmas that counts Thanksgiving I mean that's I used to have a little calendar thing and I haven't needed it so much lately but I used to just it would just be I just get up and write you know I had to write whatever and by doing that I mean you know you can kind of do the math that's you're, that's that's a pretty extreme um, output, but one of the things that keeps my creative well from draining is that I'm kind of bouncing back and forth between interesting projects. You know, if I was writing constantly doing like zombie music nonstop, you know, it can it can wear you out. You know, but I'm able to jump back and forth between these really exciting genre shows, and and that's and and that at the end of the day, I'm I'm really excited about these shows. I mean, I'm. I'm I'm a fan of these shows. I'd watch them even if I wasn't doing them. So for me, it's it's not really like work. It's 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 play. You know, I, I'm I have the luckiest job in the world. You know, so I'm very excited about all that. Um, but yeah, sleep is getting harder and harder to come by these days. <laughs> not gonna lie. Do you what? have any um, do you have any cool projects coming up on top of the five or six things that you just mentioned that you'd like to talk about? Well, you know, I got there's two features um, that I that I've done. One of which uh, is out now theatrically, limited release, and it's on VOD. It's called Europa Report, and it's a really smart, um, small science fiction movie. Um, um, and uh, the album is out now. My label uh, put it out. I may have mentioned that earlier, but but it's just it, it's one of the smartest uh, genre movies I've ever seen. It was done on a on a budget, but it's um, a really cool. Uh, realistic take on human exploration and it's technically a found footage film which shouldn't even have score um, but i wrote a really evocative kind of melodic score um, i was kind of amazed they let me get away with it to be honest um so that that was really cool and in the near future i did a movie called knights of bad astem um which has been there's a trailer out it's been teased for like two years uh it's finally coming out a long overdue release um and that score I can honestly say is uh, one of the most fun soundtracks I've ever I've ever written. It's it's kind of a heavy metal fantasy adventure movie, so you can imagine probably what the what the score sounds <laughs> like. Very cool. Um, oh, I know, I know what I wanted to ask. Are you going to appear on any of these shows as a cameo in the background? Oh man, well I I appeared in Battlestar. <laughs> um, I think that was my only. My only on camera cameo. I, I would certainly love to. Um, the, I, I've been kind of bugging the uh, the Black Sails guys for the pirate show. I mean that they need a hurdy gurdy player in their cast. Oh yeah, <laughs> I've already got the I got the look. You already kind of have like a swarthy pirate thing going totally, anyway. Yeah, totally. I'm ready to go. The only problem <laughs> is they shoot that in South Africa, so it's not like I can just hop over and uh, and uh, shoot my cameo and leave. You know, but. Uh, <laughs> We'll see. I, I don't. I don't have ambitions to be in front of the camera, so it's not something uh, I'm. Uh, I'm planning on doing, but you never know. Well, you got a chance. To, there's a. Uh, you got a chance to visit the set of Battlestar. There was a cool photo, I think, on the Twitter feed, where you've got yeah. the one of the hangers behind. You. So, I mean, there's precedent for it. You can just say, "I need to catch capture the mood of 
Black Sails, <laughs> Mr. Producer. Yeah, totally. totally. Yeah. So fly me to South Africa. Yeah, yeah totally. I'll, I'll be in the background. I'll and be guy that, at R. You need a you need an accordion player in uh, in Black Sails, and actually maybe they need an accordion player in Agents of Shield. Now that I think about it, that could be that could work. I could I could have some kind of accordion <laughs> superpower. Maybe you never know. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen. I think Kevin, did you have any other questions you wanted to? Um, no, I don't think so. Don't All right. So. Um, Bear, I really appreciate your time. You're a busy guy. Just, it Thanks. sounds exhausting. Just listening yeah. to everything. You I'm just a, I, I need a nap now. Um, you and me both, I, man. You and me both. Um, <laughs> I just want to recommend to our viewers, please check out his uh, YouTube channel because I think it's just fun to kind of see some of the enthusiasm you have working with all these musicians. It's very uh, just on Da Vinci's Demons, just on the one show, for example. You have uh, uh, getting to work with the percussionists, the vocalists, the medieval instrument players, uh, the string quartet. It's it's insane, and that's a lot of fun. And and uh, the passion I think comes through. So it's really it's been fun to talk to you. And um, good luck with everything. Uh, and I'll just say congrats on everything in the future because it, it seems like you'll have a lot of fun going That's forward and uh, Thanks, best Thank of luck you. with all projects. So, yeah, awesome. great. Thanks a lot, you guys. All right, thanks all right. a lot, Bear. All right, take care. So thanks again for enjoying our interview and thanks again to Bear McCrary for having the time to talk to us. Uh, very cool to hear about the specifics of Da Vinci's Demons or Battlestar Galactica or uh, Walking Dead or, of course, some heads up for the agents of shield this fall. Right. So very exciting and, and uh, definitely check out the shield. Cause that'll be even a different project than anything else he's worked on up to this point. Each one seems to be cool and interesting, just like he talked about. Anytime there's things that look like human beings coming after you, he doesn't want to score another TV show <laughs> that does that. So anyway, we had a fun time. I hope you guys had a fun time watching the interview and, uh, That'll do it for this week's episode. So thanks again for joining with us. Uh, you can listen to us <clears throat> on soundnotion.tv slash SAP, where you can subscribe to our show, uh, leave comments, and find links to the music that we spoke about. Uh, you can also subscribe to the show through iTunes. My name is Bill Witham. And I'm Kevin Wilt. And thank you for listening.